The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, New Frontiers in Fluorescence Guided Endocrine Surgery. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in the event today. You have joined the presentation, listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you would like to join over the telephone, just select phone call in your audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed for you. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the attendee control panel. You may send in your questions at any time. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session. Today's presenter is Dr. Fernando Dipp. Dr. Dipp is a surgeon and medical researcher, researcher from Buenos Aires, Argentina. I am now going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Dipp. Dr. Dipp? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, today, we are going to focus on the new frontiers in fluorescent guided endocrine surgery. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Diagnostic Green for supporting this idea to put in together a um, webinar series in order to try to expand and to communicate the results of this uh, novel technology that is really changing the way we operate and for sure is providing uh, surgeons and also patients more, more safety in the OR. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, Jorge Falco, who is uh, one of my mentors, and uh, Raul Rosenthal, who, um, with whom we have been working with this kind of techniques uh, almost for uh, eight years. And we, um, every week, discuss how we can improve the technology. And we are realizing from the moment we started with this that there are certain indications that are becoming a, a standard of care uh, with this technique. We are going to focus on um, this time. We are going to try to analyze the basic concept of the near infrared guided surgery. Uh, and we are going to discuss the, and to evaluate the different methods of the, this kind of technique uh, and uh, how we should use this technology and what is needed in order uh, to perform these kind of procedures. And uh, we are going to make a review of the literature of what is happening uh, with uh, fluorescence in uh, thyroidectomy and also for thyroidectomies. If we talk about thyroidectomies, we uh, know that there is a main concern about the complication after a total thyroidectomy, for example, and this has been very well described in the literature by different countries and different continents. Uh, for example, uh, this uh, very nice review performed by Chadwick and this was published in December last year, they uh, reviewed over 90,000 endocrine procedures uh, and they focalized their attention in bilateral thyroid resections. This was performed between July 2010 and June 2015. And they described that uh, the main a uh, problem after a thyroid surgery is basically hypocalcemia and we are going to see why it is so important and, and why we are uh, using this technology in order to prevent that. Uh, and if you look at the numbers, the rate of hypocalcemia that is described uh, in this review is close to 25% when we talk about transient hypocalcemia. And most importantly, when we talk about permanent hypocalcemia, and this is when the, we have patients with hypocalcemia after six months, the rate uh, of hypocalcemia is close to 7%. And this is really a very important issue for the patients because this decreases the quality of life of the patient and this uh, increases also the cost uh, of the uh, procedures. If we go to uh, the United States, um, uh, in May this year, 
um, the American Thyroid Association published uh, a review of the most common complications and how to prevent them after a total thyroidectomy and also in reoperative operations. And they described that the transient hypocalcemia in America is uh, up to 38%, and this is really very high, and the permanent hypocalcemia is in between 0 and 3% in the series that was uh, really analyzed. Uh, and why this is so important and why, what are the clinical effects of uh, an hypocalcemia? Uh, the patient may suffer neuromuscular excitability with muscle stiffness, cramps, spasms, cardiac electrical instability, and that's why the patient needs to be uh, monitored and it sustain the hospital and also in some cases in the ICU, they uh, may have prolongation of the QT interval, ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation. Um, in some cases, neuropsychiatric symptoms are present with confusion, anger, depression, and also irritability and seizures when we have a severe hypocalcemia. And as you can see, this is a real concern for everybody. Why this is uh, happening, uh, and even in experienced surgeons, is because the parathyroid glands are really very tiny, uh, tiny glands that are close to the thyroid. They have a really very small size. They are in variable in positions, so we cannot determine exactly what they're going to be during a dissection. And they are really very difficult to distinguish from the surrounding tissue in some cases. So in some how we are operated blinding when we talk about parathyroid glands. Um, in the intraoperative identification, most of the time, depends on the surgeon's experience. The concept of the uh, um, injury of the parathyroid glands is not new. It was described by William Stewart Halstead uh, in the 90s, uh, and he stated that the parathyroid glands may be injured during a thyroidectomy. And of course, this was further studies and published by many surgeons and researchers, like Delatre, who published in 1982, many years ago, um, this statement, and uh, he analyzed 100 cadaveric dissections, and he tried to determine um, the parathyroid glands that were at risk of devascularization. And uh, what he published was that uh, in up to 38% of the uh, cases, the glands were at risk of devascularization during a thyroid dissection, and in 5% of the cases, the four glands were really at risk. They compared where were more at risk, the superior and inferior glands, and in this paper there, described that the superior glands were more at risk because they have a short feeding vessels, and the posterior side, they are located uh, in the posterior side of the upper pole. And most importantly is uh, that in 80% of the cases, they have a single feeding vessel. So if we are dissecting and we have an injury in that vessel, the parathyroid gland is going to be devascularized. So what do we have so far in order to prevent or to analyze if the glands are well vascularized or not, and we, if we have to reimplant the glands, uh, we can have, you know, the, what it was described in the literature is pricking parathyroid glands or cutting off tiny fragments. Uh, this was performed, this was published uh, in the literature, but of course this is dangerous for the parathyroid glands because when you are cutting them in order to see if they uh, have a blood supply or no, you may injure the glands. Topical application of lidocaine was also uh, described. Uh, this has uh, adverse effects because you may generate the uh, palsy of the regular laryngeal nerve and the, of course, this is something that you want, don't want after the procedure. And uh, also, probably one of the most common uh, methods in order to recognize the glands that was described was the intravenous uh, administration of methylene blue. But as you know, this may have an impact on the patient. Some of them may develop methemoglobinemia. But now, in the last year, we have something totally new. This is the first time that 
uh, with a method that it is non-invasive for the surgeon, for the patient, we uh, can visualize things that we cannot visualize with another method. Uh, we are using lights and we are using uh, instruments in order to get fluorescence from the different tissues, tumors, and this is not only applied uh, on parathyroid glands, it has been described uh, in um, fluorescent cholangiogram in order to prevent an injury during the gallbladder dissection uh, and to evaluate perfusion for adrenal glands or also in colorectal surgery to avoid leaks. How does it work? Uh, we want to see a tissue. In some cases, we administrate a drug. In these cases, uh, indocine in green. The dye was uh, approved by the FDA in, in 1959. It was used uh, to evaluate uh, the cardiac out output uh, and other clinical uh, applications. Uh, and it was used very much in ophthalmology for a long period of time. And now we are using it for other uh, uh, surgical applications. We have a light source with near infrared light with a wavelength in between 780 nanometers and 830 nanometers. We illuminate the surgical field that we want to see. And then the, when we illuminate the surgical field, we are going to get the fluorescence uh, that we cannot visualize with our eyes and that's why we have a camera that is going to project the image with, that we want to see uh, in a screen and uh, like the ones that you are seeing there. The uh, concept initially was not described, uh, it was described in the 60s, but at that moment the technology was not ready to go and, and but uh, researchers still uh, work uh, on the development of this technology. They use um, immunofluorescence at the beginning, then different uh, other dyes started to be used, uh, like the protoporphyrin in order to see the parathyroid glands uh, of 5-ALA. Um, the images like you, you can see there were really very uh, nice and very good, but the, it was uh, expensive. And, and also the protoporphyrin may have adverse effect on the patient, uh, like photosensitivity to the patient, so the patients need to stay at least 48 hours in the hospital in a dark room. And after that moment, um, surgeons uh, continue studying this kind of technology, and uh, in this time with the sign in green, with new cameras and uh, a lot of papers started to be um, uh, published and in some cases it's becoming really a standard of care and it was in 2016 with the group of uh, Anita van der Hansen started uh, to publish a new method and this is without using also in the sign in green. So basically in order to see the parathyroid glands we have two different types of methods. One, that we are not going to use a dye. Uh, this, we can name that autofluorescent and it uh, help us to identify the parathyroid glands. And then we may use, we can use a dye in the signing green and I described before, and it does help us to identify the glands and also to evaluate if the glands are perfused or not. Um, we published uh, initially a group of 28 patients that underwent thyroid and parathyroid surgery. We tried to evaluate the feasibility of this uh, technique uh, and we uh, analyzed 19 female and 9 male with diagnosis of uh, in seven cases of primary hyperparathyroidism uh, and then with uh, thyroid diseases and we could detect at that moment that all of the glands that we could see had fluorescence and they could be projected uh, on a screen. And um, this was published in journal, uh, um, um, the American College of Surgeons. And uh, also we studied adenomas and we uh, realized that the adenomas also showed out of fluorescence. We analyzed the uh, intensity ratio of the different glands and what we found in there is that the parathyroid glands glow more 
in comparison to the other tissues, uh, in comparison to the thyroid glands, and also in comparison to the background. And also what we did was analyze uh, the intensity ratio of the normal glands and the adenoma. In this uh, uh, first publication, we found it that the uh, normal glands uh, glowed more in comparison to adenoma. And then uh, in further studies, we realized that it, it really depends on the adenomas. Then we analyzed the number of glands that we can see with uh, this kind of technology, and, and we compare that with the nut eye, with the, the white light. Um, in, in this paper, we analyzed 74 patients with a mean age of 48 uh, years old. Um, we also included different kinds of uh, thyroid and parathyroid pathologies. And uh, what we concluded is that we found it that when we analyzed the neck, when we visualized the glass with the white light, we found it an in average 2.5 for a thyroid glance. And then when we um, used the different equipments, the number of the glands that were identified uh, were 3.7, and this was statistically significant. So there were a lot of for a thyroid gland that we were missing without using the equipment. As you can see in that image, there's a huge difference in between the fluorescence of the parathyroid glands and the rest of the tissues. And in this graph, um, uh, I want to show you the different intensities of the, uh, the tissues. Uh, probably one of the first uh, and the most important paper that, that was published in terms of uh, the identification of the perfusion of the parathyroid glands was performed in the Seoul National University Hospital by the group of SU, and they published in surgical endoscopy in 2015 the use of endocyanin in green to evaluate the parathyroid glands. They put together a canine model. They evaluate, evaluated the parathyroid glands identification with ICG, and they used different doses from 12.5 microgram kilogram to 100 uh, microgram kilogram. And they evaluated what was the optimal dose to use, the type to pick uh, of the fluorescence, and what time they remain a sufficiently fluorescent. As you can see there, the dose that they used was really very small. The type to pick it's similar, really very similar to, to the, the time required uh, to see the parathyroid glands in humans. It, it is more or less 50 seconds. And it depends on the heart rate of the patient, basically. And they remained uh, sufficiently fluorescent for a long period of time. So it's not uh, immediate. Um, the main, probably one of the main weaknesses of this um, uh, equipment are that uh, when we turn on the equipment, we need to switch off the lights of the OR. And the, the main reason is because the near infrared light competes, uh, of the equipment compete with the near infrared light of the ceiling lights. The group of Maquette uh, are developing lamps that have filters uh, that we are using in the OR. So we don't need to switch off the OR or lights, and we are provided more safety in the procedure, as you can see there, how we are using the light with the white light and the one that is filtered. And then when we change the filters of the light, we administrate in the sign in green to the patient, and we use an, a specific um, a system. And uh, I will show you to a couple of cases before starting with a review of the literature. This is a case that we perform uh, in this week, and this is a, a, an adenoma that is in the upper, in the uh, lower pole of the thyroid uh, gland. Uh, this is the position of the patient. We illuminated the surgical field uh, with the equipment once uh, we open up. Um, the, the, the neck, and uh, after the administration of ICG, we can identify really very clear the location and the perfusion of the parathyroid glands. 
Um, this is another case uh, when uh, we were dissecting a parathyroid gland adenoma that we did uh, together with uh, Jorge Falco, and this, is, this was last week. Uh, we can see there the carotid artery that is glowing uh, really very much. And then you're going to see there um, the, uh, the artery that is providing blood supply to the parathyroid uh, adenoma. Here uh, you have more cases uh, where you can see the perfusion of the gland. As, as you can see, it's really very clear. And also after the dissection of the thyroid glands, you can test or you can try if the glands are well perfused or not, and then you can decide if you need to reimplant the glands or, or not. Um, there were papers that really described, the, 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 they compare both methods, uh, endocyanin green perfusion and autofluorescence in order to evaluate the parathyroid glands. This was uh, described by the group of Edinburgh and Cleveland Clinic, Ohio, and they put together 39 total thyroidectomies and five lobectomy. They analyzed the detection rate uh, of the parathyroid glands with both methods, the detection rate of the parathyroid glands before, you know, using the equipment with nactide and the rate of hypocalcemia. Very interestingly, the detection rate of parathyroid glands was really very similar with both technique, 95% or so 98%, and this was not statistically significant. Uh, the detection rate uh, was higher when the autofluorescent was used at the beginning, but at the same time, autofluorescent cannot determine the uh, perfusion of the glands. And if you look at the rate of hypocalcemia using the cyan in green, the hypocalcemia rate was lower compared to the uh, endocyanin in green. So basically they concluded that they have similar ability to detect parathyroid glands, but they differ in timing of identification. This is a, a trial that we put together uh, with uh, Jorge Falco, with Raul Rosenthal, Silvina Verna, and this was published, uh, uh, this was presented in the last fluorescent meeting in Fort Lauderdale, uh, and this is under review uh, now for publication. We put together 170 patients uh, that were enrolled. Uh, the most uh, common uh, pathologies were cancer and, and goiter. We analyzed again the number of glands that could be visualized with the, the near infrared system and with the nactide. Again, similar uh, differences 2.54 with the nactide and with the near infrared equipment 3.53. Uh, uh, and uh, we try to determine if this has a clinical impact on the patients. And in the group that we did not use the equipment, the transit hypocalcemia was 17.6%. 7, when we started to use the equipment in that group, the rate of hypocalcemia was 8.2%. So, and, and this was really impressive to us. And uh, similar uh, papers uh, are published in the literature. This is a really very interesting paper that was published in January this year. Uh, this was performed in Marseille. They put together 513 patients. Uh, they compared the results, the, the outcome of the patients in two different periods of times. Um, and it was performed by two different surgeons, one with five years of experience and the other one with uh, 25 years uh, of experience. And uh, as you can see, they are evaluated the identification of the parathyroid glands, the autotransplantation of the glands, and the inadvertent resection of the glands. Uh, and when using the equipment, the, uh, the rate of parathyroid glands that were identified was higher, the, uh, the parathyroid glands that were auto-transplantated uh, uh, auto were much lower comparing the, uh, the groups that, uh, in which the near infrared system was not used, and also the inadvertent section was really uh, very low. Uh, the, um, uh, they evaluated the uh, rate of hypocalcemia 
that that they uh, use and if you look at the uh, the rate of hypocalcemia the when they use the equipment uh, with autofluorescence the uh, it dropped from 20 percent to five percent while the group that did not use hypocalcemia stayed the same the the group of fortunity also analyzed the uh, the um, uh, identification of the parathyroid glands within the cyanin green, and they scored the uh, different uh, parathyroid glands according, according to the perfusion. Uh, when the score was zero, they put the score zero when the parathyroid glands were black, score one when they were gray, and the score two when they were black, uh, uh, white, well perfused. Uh, they analyzed the different uh, groups. And if you can see the when the score was two, so at least when one gland was white or well perfused, they did not find any, uh, just only two transit hypocalcemia. And when the score was zero or one, the transit hypocalcemia uh, was higher. They found it 11 patients and two that require calcium uh, supplementation and permanent uh, hypocalcemia in two patients. This was also studied for primary hypoparathyroidism, uh, the group of the long, uh, they published in February this year, as you can see, the papers are really uh, uh, very new. Uh, they administrated three milliliters of indocyanin in green. Uh, they evaluated uh, after one minute, the administration, the neck with the near infrared system, and they compared the, uh, adenomas that were not founded with the preoperative study and what they concluded is that the system really helped them to find those adenomas that were missing in the preoperative study. Uh, the, this was also this kind of technique were, were also described also in a secondary hypoparathyroidism. The dose that they use uh, was different. They used a 0 0.5 milligram kilogram one hour before the procedure. The mean interval administration at the gland identification was uh, after 75 uh, uh, minutes, and they described something that is really very interesting, that the signal was present after 252 minutes. They also studied the variables that uh, may change the intensity of the parathyroid glands and the, uh, the PTH and the parathyroid glands had really an impact on the fluorescence. When the PTH was higher than 100 and in the 1900, the fluorescence was higher and also with the parathyroid gland adenoma where the, the parathyroid glands were um, bigger than one centimeters. They try to uh, analyze the sensitivity and the specificity of the technique, and they stated that the sen sensitivity of the uh, near infrared system to detect the parathyroid glands in this case was 91%, and this was higher compared to the preoperative studies. Uh, so, in order to conclude, uh, uh, I believe that there is a place for near infrared guided surgery for endocrine. Uh, procedures. There is evident, enough evidence that supports the use of autofluorescence for early identification and increase of visualization of parathyroid glands, and that parathyroid gland perfusion evaluation with the sign green has demonstrated to be useful to consider reimplantation of parathyroid glands and can be a complement as a predictor uh, uh, of hypocalcemia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dip. We're now going to begin answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. Dr. Dip, our first question is, can you use this technology when using minimally invasive techniques? Yeah, you can. Uh, the different, uh, you need to use, uh, of course, um, uh, different equipments. You need to, to use a, a scope. Um, the minimal invasive uh, parathyroidectomy uh, was extensively described in the literature. It has really cosmetic advantages. Um, the, the 
main problem is that the, the place that you're working is smaller, so uh, you need a more a scope than a camera for open surgery. But uh, even though you can use that, yeah. Great, thank you. Our next question asks, you have shown that the literature has not a consensus on what dose of ICG should be used to see the glands. What is your recommendation according to your experience? We have seen that the, when the thyroid gland is in place, uh, we should use uh, as the minimal dose as possible. We are trying to use uh, as low as uh, one milliliter of inocyanin in green and the parathyroid glands really glow a lot. Uh, uh, and then, yeah, one milliliter, I believe it's fine. Wonderful, thank you. Our next question asks, do you consider this technology should be used routinely or in selective cases during thyroid procedures? Uh, I believe that this technology uh, allows us to see more, more during a procedure. So uh, you never know when you're going to have a problem during a surgery and probably the parathyroid glands may be hidden uh, and you may injure them. And that's why I believe this kind of technology should be used routinely uh, in, in the, during the cases in order to provide more safety uh, to, the patient, to the patients. It's like we, every time we talk about this technology, we compare this with a GPS. We never know when you're going to use it, but you want to have it. I love that analogy. Thank you. Um, our next question asks, can this technique be used to identify metastatic lymph nodes when conducting neck dissection? Well, um, we haven't tried that. Uh, the near-infrared guided uh, surgery uh, for sure is, you know, working in, 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 is focalized also in that way. But in order to recognize a metastasis, uh, you need to tag the endocyanin ring with a, a specific receptor. Uh, there are a lot of studies that, that, are, study, uh, that are evaluating uh, the sensitivity and specificity of this kind of technology to recognize cancer. Uh, this is uh, totally another chapter. There are a lot of people that are working with specific antibodies um, with different dyes in order to recognize the, uh, the cancer. Uh, with indocyanin green and, and also with autofluorescence, uh, you don't, uh, can be so much specific in terms of, of cancer, at least with the information we have so far. Great, thank you. Boy, we're getting a lot of questions and um, we're going to address as many as we can. Keep submitting those questions and we'll get through them. Our next question asks, how many types of fluorescent imaging systems are available to use for this technique? Well, there are, there are really different companies that are working um, with this kind of technology. And a, a, every day, there are more and more companies. Uh, at, at least uh, there are three or four uh, really uh, in, the, in the market. Um, uh, really, it's, it's, it's not fair if I name uh, different uh, companies, but, you know, more, uh, most of them have really very good quality and, uh, and you can, you know, perform the procedures really very safe with the different companies. Thank you. Our next question asks, in your experience, what are the most relevant shortcomings of using ICG during parathyroid resections? I believe that uh, for thyroid, total thyroidectomy, for sure, it uh, uh, will become in a standard of care uh, because you can recognize where the glands are and also the perfusion. Uh, you know, every surgeon that operates a primary hypoparathyroidism notes that it can be a very easy surgery a procedure or also a very challenging a, a, a procedure because sometimes uh, it's uh, difficult to find the adenoma and I believe if you have something that uh, gives you more information then uh, it's, it's going to be good for the surgeon and good for the patient. So uh, I believe it's going to become a standard of care. 
Great, thank you. Our next question asks, why not use both techniques, autofluorescent followed by ICG? I believe that this is uh, the way to work. I believe that we should use uh, uh, autofluorescence uh, in order to detect the polythidol glands and, and, and also the use of indocyanin green uh, in order to detect the location of the glands and or also the perfusion of the glands. There are, uh, it, it's not one on another, I believe it's the two procedures that are needed. Okay, great. And this will be our final question and we'll get answers back to um, everybody else um, separately just in the interest of time. So our final question is, which is the mechanism of the fluorescence of the parathyroid glands? Well, there are uh, different uh, theories. Um, uh, there are uh, the researchers that describe probably an influence of the uh, uh, calcium channels, uh, others that uh, you know state that the mitochondria may they have fluorescence and, and, and the others that uh, hypothesize that they uh, may be due to the, uh, the type of the cells of the parathyroid glands, but this is not a, a conclusion, you know, this is under review nowadays. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Dip. So um, as mentioned, that was our final question and we will uh, get back to you guys with the um, other questions submitted and answers offline. So thank you so much, Dr. Dip. We're gonna go ahead and conclude today's webinar. I'd like to thank you, Dr. Dip, and thank you everybody else for attending today's webinar, New Frontiers in Fluorescence Endocrine Guided Surgery. If you do have any other questions, please contact Ron Clark at Diagnostic Green, email address ron at diagnosticgreen.com. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation and we would appreciate it if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view the recording of today's webinar. On behalf of the International Society of Fluorescent Guided Surgery, Diagnostic Green, and our presenter, thank you so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.